Well, for most of us, I hardly need to introduce Pastor Christian. He was with us for over eight years ministering to our youth and ministering to the rest of us as well. It is a joy to have both he and Stacy with us. It's unfortunate we couldn't have the four children too because they were born and kind of grew up here with us. Um, but for some of you that are new, you may not realize that he had this ministry with us and we're very grateful that he can be here this morning. It's been announced for a couple of weeks, and I, I had to joke with him. He's almost achieved um, legendary status around here uh, because, in fact, somebody said this morning, this is going to be an extra special morning. In other words, the other mornings where I'm preaching are normal. <laughs> so we're in a special treat this morning. It is a joy to have Pastor Christian come and minister to us with the Word of God. He's been so faithful to do that in the past, and I'm grateful for you. So come. I was just going to wing it, so I felt I felt a lot of pressure. It's good to see so many familiar faces, even unfamiliar faces. New faces are a sign of church growth, which is good. I want to say thank you to all of you for your support, your prayers, the financial support that the church gives us. Uh, I have no problem telling you that we, we wouldn't be able to afford living down there if the church didn't help us out. So thank you so much for that. I'm so thankful to be able to open the Word of God to you this morning. It's been since the last time I, I was here that I, I've preached, so uh, I'm so thankful for the opportunity. And the only complaint I have about preaching is I don't get to hear Monty preach, um, but, I, but I'm thankful for the opportunity. Let's, let's pray. Father, we thank you. For your goodness towards us. We thank you that we can all be together this morning. We thank you for the wedding yesterday, Elise and Caleb. We pray that you'd bless them as they're traveling today. Father, most of all, we ask that you would reveal yourself to us to a greater degree this morning in your word. I pray that the sight of you would do wondrous things in our lives this morning. I pray that it would comfort us especially. In Christ's name I pray, amen. If you had to give a one-word description of the times in which we live, what word would you give? And whatever word comes to your mind, I'm sure, I'm confident that we would all agree that the word dark fits the bill. We are living in some very dark times. Perhaps country and the history of the world has been as wicked as the United States presently is. And of course, someone may respond to that by asking, what about, what about Nazi Germany? Don't forget that they killed six million Jews. And while that's horrific, let's not forget that America has murdered 60 million precious lives through abortion. Not only is America guilty of murdering the most helpless among us, but it is guilty of gross immorality, gross sexual immorality. We've become Sodom and Gomorrah. Evil is called good and good evil. And because of all these things, Christians are becoming increasingly intolerable. Frankly, it can be frightening to consider where all of this is going. And so this leads me to ask a very simple, but I believe significant question. The question is, where is God? Where is God in a society such as ours? And the answer is, he is there. He is there. He is as present in the night as he is in the day. He is presently controlling all things. And I, I just want to give you this, this definition. And before I tell you what I'm defining, let me, let me just give you the definition itself. God, ever since the creation of the world, has in, has in some indis, invisible, inscrutable way, upheld all things by his power 
and has controlled every single action, event, so that his glory will be the most greatly seen and appreciated, and so that his church would be the most benefited. Let me say that one more time, perhaps a little bit more clearly. Ever since the creation of the world, God has, in some invisible and inscrutable way, sustained and governed all creatures, actions, and events to the praise of his glorious perfections and to the benefit of his chosen people. And we refer to this precious truth as divine providence. Divine providence. And let me just say that if you've never studied the providence of God, you need to. You need to. The Puritans believe that the study of divine providence was a divine imperative, and I I agree with that. But not only uh, should you study it because it's a divine imperative, but because it is also one of the greatest comforts we have as Christians. It is a soft, soft pillow which allows the people of God to go to sleep at night. It's how Christians can look at a troubled world without becoming troubled themselves. Where is God when he cannot be found in society like ours? He is there. He is both present and active. And I want to show you this uh, from Scripture this morning. And more specifically, I want to show you this from what has become one of my favorite canonical books. So if, if you would, take your Bibles and turn to the book of Esther. Turn to the book of Esther. As you all know, Esther is a wonderful story about how the Jews were saved from certain annihilation through a Jewish orphan girl who became the queen of Persia. What you may not know is that Esther, although wonderful, is rather weird. It's peculiar. Why is that? Well, because it's the only book in both the Old and New Testaments where God is not directly mentioned. Did you know that for the first 700 years of church history, not one commentary was written on the book of Esther. Even John Calvin, who is perhaps one of the greatest expositors church history has ever known, skipped over it in his commentary series. Martin Luther expressed in a way only he could, I am so great an enemy of the second book of the Maccabees and to Esther that I wish they had not come to us at all, for they have too many heathen unnaturalities. Karen Jobes, in her helpful commentary on Esther, writes that in one sense, this book has next to nothing to commend it as a religious text. Much less, she says, the inspired word of God to the Christian church. The only textual link it has to the rest of the Old Testament is that the story it tells involves the Jewish people. She says, if one went through the text and replaced every occurrence of the word Jews with the name of some other ethnic group, there would be no reason to think the story had anything at all to do with the Bible. What do we make of this? What do we do with that? Was, was the author of Esther unaware of Yahweh, the God of Israel? Did a, did a secular history of, of two Jews in Susa during the Achaemenid Persian Empire somehow find its way into the canon of Scripture? How is the absence of God in Esther to be explained? I would submit to you that the absence of God in Esther is a literary device. And what it does is it serves to strengthen the main message of the book that God, by his unseen hand, directs history through seemingly insignificant and ordinary events of everyday life. Let me say that again. The absence of God in Esther 
is a literary device that serves to strengthen the main message of the book, which is that God, by his unseen hand, directs history through seemingly insignificant and ordinary events of everyday life. It's actually rather brilliant. What better way to write a book teaching that God is at work even when he cannot be found than by writing a book where God is obviously at work but cannot be found? As one has said, once the theological message of the book is understood, it is appropriate that God is not mentioned. In fact, the complete absence of God from the text is the genius of the book from which Its hope and encouragement flow to us today. I trust you see why I selected Esther then as my text this morning. And just as God was present and active in uh, pagan Persia thousands of years ago, he is present and active in pagan America today, albeit behind the scenes. And before I, I draw too much of an application from Esther... Let me direct your attention to several examples of providence throughout the book. Uh, I want to direct you to uh, examples of providence relating to four major events within the book. And let me give you those four major events. Uh, They are, number one, Vashti's deposal. Vashti's deposal. Number two, Esther's designation as queen. Number three, Haman's downfall. And number four, the Jews' domination of their enemies. Those are four major events, and we'll see varying or various examples of providence relating to those events. We'll see how far we can get. Uh, First, let me direct your attention to a few examples of providence relating to Vashti's deposal. Before Esther could become queen, Queen Vashti had to be deposed. But let's look at the text to see how this came about. We read in chapter 1, verse 3, that Ahasuerus, the king of Persia, towards the beginning of his reign, gave a banquet for all his princes, the text says, and attendants, the army officers of Persia and Media, the nobles and the princes of his provinces. Most commentators believe this banquet was meant to secure support for a military campaign Ahasuerus was about to lead against the Greeks. But whatever the case may be, I think it's clear that the king of Persia knew how to party. This event lasted six whole months. In verse 5, we read that another banquet was given lasting seven days for all the people who were present at the citadel in Susa, from the greatest to the least. And perhaps this was some sort of thank you to the people that lived uh, in Susa for making the previous six months possible. Now, it was at the end of this second banquet that Ahasuerus made a drunken request. Look at verses 10 and 11. They say, On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded Mehuman, Biztha, Harbona, Bigtha, Abagtha, Zethar, and Carcass, the seven eunuchs who served in the presence of the king, Ahasuerus, to bring Queen Vashti before the king with her royal crown in order to display her beauty to the people and the princes, for she was beautiful. Verse 12, however, informs us that Vashti refused making the king very angry so that his wrath burned within him. And if we kept reading, we would see that this led Ahasuerus to inquire of his wise men what was to be done to Vashti for her insubordination. That's in verse 15. And the wise men, fearing the beginnings of a woman's liberation movement, it's there, They counseled the king to make an example out of Vashti by replacing her as queen. Verse 19. The thought was that by doing so, every wife in Persia would come to understand that not even the queen could get away with defying her husband. This plan pleased Ahasuerus, and so Queen Vashti was deposed. Now, what I would have you consider this morning is that a series of human actions... And desires 
not miracles, led to Vashti's deposal. First, there's Ahasuerus' decision to throw a party and his request for Vashti to display her beauty. All that the king did in this chapter, he did for himself. As one has said, a completely pagan king decides for a completely worldly reason to give a banquet designed for self-aggrandizement. So, so strong was the king's desire to appear great in the eyes of his subjects that he was even willing to make his queen a sort of sex object. Second, there's, there's Vashti's decision to defy the king. Opinions defer as to why exactly she uh, did not comply with the king's command. Some say she disobeyed out of self-respect. Others say she disobeyed out of obedience to a pre-existing Persian law. Still others that she was pregnant and unable to make an appearance. Uh, honestly, it doesn't really matter why she disobeyed, but the fact that she did. Last, there's the wise men's counsel and Ahasuerus' decision to accept it. Uh, similar to the king, the wise men did what they did for selfish reasons. They counseled Ahasuerus to replace the queen because they didn't want to lose control of their own wives. So you see... All that we read in this chapter was the result of of human decisions and actions. Nothing extraordinary happened. And yet, and yet, everything was significant. Think about it. One seeming insignificant event led to another, which led to another, which led to another. Ahasuerus' decision to throw a party led to him making a drunken request. And this drunken request led uh, led to Vashti's decision to defy the king. And Vashti's decision to defy the king led to the wise men's counsel to depose her, which, of course, he did. And, And you might be wondering, why does all this matter? Well, it matters because Vashti's removal made Esther's rise to power possible. Humanly speaking, if Vashti was never banished, Esther would never have become queen. And if Esther had never become queen, the Jews would have been destroyed. And yet, instead of that happening, everything served only to help the Jews. Now we have to ask, did the events of chapter 1 happen by coincidence? Was this all happenstance? And although the text doesn't say, we're meant to deduce that it was all due to divine superintendence. For those who have eyes to see, although God is nowhere mentioned in chapter 1, he is everywhere. He can be seen using every human decision and action, even when they arise from sinful motivations and are done for questionable reasons. We can see him using all those things for his glory and for his people's good. And he's doing the same today. Isn't that a comforting thought? Consider the fact that the providence of God is not limited to working through the decision-making of sober people. Here... In our text, he can be seen working even through the inebriated. God directed history through the sinful demand of a drunk world ruler. Doesn't that give you some comfort in light of who our current president is? He doesn't need to be in his right mind for God to accomplish his will through him. He is. No no stick is too crooked that God cannot write or draw a straight line with. Much more can be said concerning the providence of God in this first chapter, but I'll limit myself to perhaps one more observation, and it's this. God's providence is proactive, not reactive. God's providence is proactive, not reactive. And what I mean by this is uh, God's unseen hand was at work before any problems had arisen. No problems had arisen yet. At this point in the story, the people of God were not in danger. It would be years until Haman hatched his wicked plot. If anything is clear, it is the fact that God never reacts. Rather, with everything that happens, God is accomplishing a countless number of things that will not come into play until a distant point in the future. We can rest assured that God is 
currently orchestrating events for issues of which we are presently unaware. Having directed your attention to a few examples of providence relating to Vashti's deposal, let me in the second place direct your attention to a few more examples relating to Esther's designation as queen. As you all very well know, Esther, to put it nicely, won the heart of Ahasuerus. But how did that all come about? How how did a Jewish orphan girl become the queen of Persia? There are three details in the text that I want you to notice. First, I want you to notice how the queen was chosen. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. Chapter 2, verse 1. I want you to notice how the queen was chosen. Verse 1 says, After these things, when the anger of King Ahasuerus had subsided, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what had been decreed against her. Historians believe chapter 2 picks up just after Ahasuerus returned from his disastrous military campaign against the Greeks. He had been humiliated just as his father Darius had been. And to add insult to injury, there was no beautiful Queen Vashti to return to. Ahasuerus needed a distraction. And his attendants had just the idea, a beauty pageant of sorts. So we read in verses 2 through 4. Then the king's attendants who served him said, Let beautiful young virgins be sought for the king. Let the king appoint overseers in all the provinces of his kingdom that they may gather every beautiful young virgin to the citadel of Susa, to the harem, into the custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the women, and let their cosmetics be given them. Then let the young lady who pleases the king be queen in place of Vashti. And the matter pleased the king, and he did accordingly. This has providence written all over it. How so? Well, this was not the way queens were typically chosen. You you probably know this just from watching Disney movies. (laughs) Queens were typically chosen from nobility. We see this in the life of Ahasuerus' father, Darius. He chose his wife, selected his wives, I should say, from nobility. Queens, for the most part, came from high-ranking families. And yet, for some reason, perhaps to add some excitement to the king's life, it was suggested that he not limit himself to the daughters of the elite, but to gather every beautiful young virgin for consideration. Now, if you're still wondering how this has providence written all over it, look at verse 5. Look at verse 5. Verses 5 through 7 say, Now there was at the citadel in Susa a Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Yair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite, who had been taken into exile from Jerusalem with the captives who had been exiled with Jeconiah, king of Judah, when Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had exiled. Whom? He was bringing up Hadassah, the text says, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had no father or mother. Now, the author of Esther says, now the young lady was what? beautiful of form and face. It it just so happened that the new queen would be chosen solely on the basis of beauty, and it just so happened that there was an absolutely beautiful young Jewess in Susa. Do you see the sovereignty of God at work? Again, God uses human decision and action to accomplish his will. It doesn't matter who makes or does them. It doesn't matter what motivations are behind them. He accomplishes his will through them. That was the first detail I wanted you to notice relating to Esther's designation as queen. Second, I want you to notice Esther's good looks. I know you're typically not instructed to notice the good looks of women from this pulpit, But for good reason in this instance, we are meant to. Where did Esther's good looks come from? Well, from her her mom and dad, of course. Yes, but where did they ultimately come from? Let me read you a passage from Job chapter 10. You don't have to turn there. Job chapter 10 verses 8 through 11 uh, says, Your hands fashioned and made me altogether. 
You have made me as clay. Did you not pour me out like milk and curdle me like cheese, clothe me with skin and flesh and knit me together with bones and sinews? The answer, of course, is yes. God was intimately involved in the formation of Job and he was intimately involved in the formation of Esther. Her her comeliness was not coincidental. Not only did God see to it that in some unseen way the next queen of Persia would be chosen according to her beauty, but he saw to it that there would be a beautiful young lady in Susa at just the right time. Here again, we also see that the providence of God is proactive and not reactive. God was not scrambling for a a beauty contestant in Ahasuerus' beauty pageant. Instead, He had provided for this moment years in advance through the ordinary means of Esther's parents. The last detail I want you to notice relating to Esther's designation as queen is her continual experience of favor. Look at verse 9. It says, So it came about when the command and decree of the king were heard, and many young ladies were gathered to the citadel of Susa into the custody of Haggai, that Esther was taken to the king's palace into the custody of Haggai, who is in charge of the women. Now, the text says, the young lady pleased him and found favor with him. So he quickly provided her with her cosmetics and food, gave her seven choice maids from the king's palace, and transferred her and her maids to the best place in the harem. Look at verse 15. It says, now, when the turn of Esther, the daughter of Abihel, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his daughter, came to go into the king, she did not request anything except what Haggai, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the woman, advised. And Esther found favor in the eyes of all who saw her. Lastly, look at verse 17. It says, the king loved Esther more than all the women. And she found favor and kindness with him more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Esther found favor. Esther found favor. Esther found favor. This is especially remarkable as it concerns the king. I mean, just consider how many beautiful young ladies Ahasuerus must have chosen from. What made Esther stand out above the rest? How does one account for her continual experience of favor? Again, the the author doesn't say. He's quiet. But he does not have to, does he? Esther's popularity is best explained by the hidden hand of God upon her life. Having said that, You should know that it's clear from other accounts in Scripture that it is God who grants certain men and women favor in the eyes of other people. Consider the story of Joseph, another wonderful story of God's providence. In Acts chapter 7, verses 9 through 10, we read, The patriarchs became jealous of Joseph and sold him into Egypt. Yet God was with him and rescued him from all his afflictions and granted him favor. And wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he made him governor over Egypt and all his household. It was God who granted Joseph favor, and it was God who granted Esther favor. Interestingly, God preserved the people of Israel in both the stories of Joseph and Esther by granting his servants favor so that they attained high status. And perhaps a lesson we can draw from that simple observation is that God's providence is not bound to any specific period of time. Remember the definition of providence I gave you. Ever since the creation of the world, God has in some invisible and inscrutable way sustained and governed all creatures, actions, and events to the praise of his glorious perfections and to the benefit of his chosen people. The same act of providence that we read of in Genesis, we read of in Esther. And doesn't that give us confidence that God's providence is at work in the world today? It does. So far, we've seen examples of providence relating to Vashti's deposal and Esther's designation as queen. 
uh, permit me to direct your attention to examples of providence relating to Haman's downfall. Haman's downfall. You may recall that the threat of the Jews being exterminated arose from an episode between two individuals, Mordecai and Haman. This episode is recounted for us in the first several verses of chapter 3. Beginning in verse 1, we read, After these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, and advanced him and established his authority over all the princes who were with him. All the king's servants were at the king's gate, who were at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman. For so the king had commanded concerning him. But Mordecai neither bowed down nor paid homage. Then the king's servants who were at the king's gate said to Mordecai, Why are you transgressing the king's command? Now it was when they had spoken daily to him, and he would not listen to them, that they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's reason would stand. For he had told them that he was a Jew. When Haman saw that Mordecai neither bowed down nor paid homage to him, Haman was filled with rage. But he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had told him who the people of Mordecai were. Therefore, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai, who were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus. After reading that passage, you can't help but wonder, why didn't Mordecai just bow? Why didn't he just bow? Some say Mordecai didn't bow to Haman because he was being a good Jew, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. However, there's, there's no law in the Old Testament which forbids the people of Israel to give their respects, to pay their respects to kings and rulers. And besides that, it is known from other sources that Jews did in fact bow to pagan officials of the Persian court. Not in a religious way, of course, but as a part of protocol. Others say it was because Mordecai knew his Jewish history. They say Haman was a descendant of Agag, the king of the Amalekites. Remember that the Amalekites, who were the first nation to attack and try to destroy the people of Israel after the Exodus, were cursed by God because of that. As re, uh, so this is why some claim Mordecai did not bow. He knew his history. This is also why Haman sought to destroy all the Jews. He had heard the story of how the prophet Samuel hacked his distant relative to pieces. The problem with this answer is that archaeologists have uncovered an inscription which indicates that Agag was the name of a province in Persia. So most likely, Haman is called an Agagite simply because he was from Agag. Still others say Mordecai was simply being prideful. This is why he did not bow. And as we all know, the most offensive thing to a prideful person is another prideful person. And this is why Haman wanted to wipe out not just Mordecai, but all of his people. So which is it? How do we make a sense of him not bowing? Once again, I, I don't think it matters that much. That's not the point of the story. If it, if it mattered, the text would tell us. What truly is the point here is that there came a man who hated the people of God and had the power and influence to do something about it, and do something he did. Look at verse 8. It says, Then Haman said to Agag, or then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered and dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from those of other people, and they do not observe the king's laws. So it is not in the king's interest to let them remain. If it is pleasing to the king, let it be decreed that they be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who carry on the king's business, to put it into the king's treasuries. The son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. Oh, sorry. Then the king took his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. The king said to Haman, the silver is yours, and the people also do to them as you please. I cannot overstate how big of a deal this was. This, this was not only a matter of, of life and death, but of eternal life and of eternal death. 
And not only for the Jews, but for the whole world. The covenants are at stake. In reality, this was satanic. If Haman succeeded, God's covenants would have failed. If, if he succeeded, there would be no savior. Now, we, we know that Haman's sinister plot did not succeed. Praise God. Far from being victorious, Haman's corpse was impaled on the very gallows which he had built for Mordecai. You know the story. But how did such a reversal come about? How did such a reversal come about? That's what I want to direct your attention to. And so let me give you, again, some examples of providence. The first example of providence relating to Haman's downfall uh, it can be found in chapter 2 with Mordecai's discovery of an assassination plot. Look at verse 21 of chapter 2. It says, In those days when Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Bigsen and Teresh, two of the king's officials from those who guarded the door, became angry and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. But the plot became known to Mordecai, and he told Queen Esther, and Esther informed the king in Mordecai's name. Now when the plot was investigated and found to be so, they were both hanged on a gallows, and it was written in the book of the Chronicles in the king's presence." There are actually multiple happenstances for us here that were recorded for us. First, note where Mordecai worked. Note where he worked. He, he just so happened to work at the king's gate where he could overhear the king's officials. Second, note what Mordecai overheard. I, I doubt very much that Bigthin and Teresh were talking indiscreetly. You don't talk out loud about a person who can execute you without any reasons. More than likely, the king's officials were, were whispering or at least uh, talking quieter than normal, and yet Mordecai somehow happened to overhear their conversation. Lastly, note Mordecai's heroics. Note that they were recorded but not rewarded. You should know that this was a really unusual failure. This did not happen. The Persian kings were especially careful to honor loyal subjects such as Mordecai because it promoted just that loyalty. If you don't want to be assassinated, treat those who foil assassination attempts very well. How could Ahasuerus forget? Whatever the immediate reasons were, the ultimate reason was God. This unusual failure of the king would actually work to Mordecai's advantage and to the advantage of the whole Jewish race down the road. More on that later. For now, just consider that although the author does not attribute any of these events to God, it's hard to attribute them to anything else. Be between serendipity and superintendence, the latter's more probable. You have to see that. Through Mordecai's occupation, through his good hearing, through Ahasuerus' forgetfulness, God was orchestrating the eventual downfall of Haman. A, se a second example of providence relating to Haman's downfall is Esther's hesitancy before the king. Let me quickly catch you up. Uh, after Mordecai learned of the decree to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all of the Jews, both young and old, women and children, he sent back one of the eunuchs to inform Esther and to order her to go to the king to implore his favor and to plead with him for her people. The problem was what? No one could appear before the king unsummoned. To do so was to risk one's life. Mordecai, however convinced Esther that she would not escape death by remaining silent. So she decided to do what she could, concluding, if I perish, I perish. When Esther finally appeared before the king, she obtained favor in his sight, and the king extended to Esther the golden scepter which was in his hand. Ahasuerus asked Esther what was troubling her and what was her request, promising her up to half of the kingdom. Esther responded by asking that he and Haman attend a banquet 
that she had prepared that day. So the king approved in order that Haman be brought quickly. And this brings us to chapter 5. Chapter 5, verse 6. Why don't you turn there? Chapter 5, verse 6. Verse 6 says, again, this is the banquet with just the king, Esther, and Haman. As they drank their wine at the banquet, the king said to Esther, What is your petition? For it shall be granted to you. And what is your request? Even to half of the kingdom it shall be done. This is Esther's chance. This is her chance to reveal her ethnicity, as well as Haman's diabolical plot to kill her and all her people. What does she say? We are told. So Esther replied, My petition and my request is, if I have found favor in the sight of the king, and if it pleases the king to grant my petition and to do what I request, may the king and Haman come to the banquet which I will prepare for them, and tomorrow I will do as the king says. She hesitates. She postpones. Why? Again, it it doesn't matter why. What matters is that she did. And why does it matter? Well, as we come to see, Esther's hesitancy allowed for several important developments to occur, which are recorded for us in the next chapter. This had to happen this way. And and, and we we see this so clearly as we read verses 1 through 12 of chapter 6. Let let me do that for us now. The most significant development, of course, is what we're about to read about, Ahasuerus' sleepless night. Whatever the reason Esther hesitated, this was all part of God's perfect plan. Uh, Chapter 6, verse 1 says, During that night the king could not sleep. Providence. So he gave an order to bring the book of records, the chronicles, and they were read before the king. Providence. It was found written what Mordecai had reported concerning Bigtha and Teresh, two of the king's units who were doorkeepers, that they had sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus, providence. The king said, what honor or dignity dignity has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? Then the king's servants who attended him said, nothing has been done for him. As already mentioned, providence, he was uh, not rewarded, although his deed, his heroics were recorded. So the king said, who is in the court? Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the king's palace in order to speak to the king about hanging Mordecai on the gallows, which he had prepared for him. The king's servant said to him, Behold, Haman is standing in the court. And the king said, Let him come in. So Haman came in, and the king said to him, What is to be done for the man whom the king desires to honor? And Haman said to himself, Whom would the king desire to honor more than me? Then Haman said to the king, For the man whom the king desires to honor, let them bring a royal robe which the king has worn, and the horse on which the king has ridden, and on whose head a royal crown has been placed. And let the robe and the horse be handed over to one of the king's most noble princes, and let them array the man whom the king desires to honor, and lead him on a horseback through the city square, and proclaim before him, Thus it shall be done for the man whom the king desires to honor. Then the king said to Haman, Take quickly the robes and the horse as you have said, and do so for Mordecai, the Jew who is sitting at the king's gate. Do not fall short in anything of all that you have said. So Haman took the robe and the horse and arrayed Mordecai and led him on horseback through the city square and proclaimed before him, Thus it shall be done to the man whom the king desires to honor. Then Mordecai returned to the king's gate. But Haman hurried home, mourning with his head covered. We simply don't have time to talk about everything we could talk about. Suffice it to say that if Ahasuerus had a good night's sleep, or if he had taken up some other activity in his restlessness, or had some other portion of the book of records been read, Mordecai would have died. But the Lord saw to it that these events transpired just as they did. I like the way one commentator, commentator, his name is John Martin, he put it this way. He said, the entire course of history for the Jewish nation was changed because a pagan king, hundreds of miles from the center of God's activities in Jerusalem, 
could not sleep. Now remember that none of this would have happened if Esther had not hesitated. Still, why does it matter that it did happen? Well, with Mordecai's loyalty fresh on his mind, the king was in a perfect place to hear Esther's request. If Esther had asked the day before, the king may or may not have remembered who Mordecai was or or what he had done. But now, when Esther reveals that Haman's plot... uh, When Esther reveals that Haman's plot ensured her death as well as the death of Mordecai, such a loyal subject, it could not be more repugnant. Do you see that? She hesitates. All of this happens. Now he's in the perfect place to hear Esther's request. This brings us to the last example of providence relating to Haman's downfall. After Haman honored Mordecai at the behest of Ahasuerus, the king's eunuchs brought him to the second banquet Esther had prepared. When Ahasuerus, Esther, and Haman were all together again, the king once again asked Esther what her petition was. And this time, without hesitating, Esther replied in verse 3 of chapter 7, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my life be given me as my petition and my people as my request. For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. Now, if we had only been sold as slaves, men and women, I would have remained silent, for the trouble would be not commensurate with the annoyance to the king. Then King Ahasuerus asked Queen Esther, Who is he, and where is he, who would presume to do thus? Esther said, A foe and an enemy is this wicked Haman. Then Haman became terrified before the king and queen. What an awkward dinner. You may remember that Mordecai had counseled Esther to keep her ethnicity, her identity a secret. Again, that's an example of providence we can't really touch on. Haman had no idea that Esther was a Jew or that she had gotten the king to sign off on her death warrant. The king was clueless as well. No doubt this is why he stormed out of the room in such a rage. Remember, Persian decrees were irreversible. The king could not revoke the command he had made concerning the Jews and his beloved queen. As Ahasuerus uh, went out to the palace garden, Haman stayed and begged for his life from Esther. And this is where we see that that final example of providence relating to Haman's downfall. Look at verse 7. It says, The king arose in his anger from drinking wine and went into the palace garden. But Haman stayed to beg for his life from Queen Esther, for he saw that harm had been determined against him by the king. Now when the king returned from the palace garden into the place where they were drinking wine, Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was. Talk about bad timing. Apparently Haman tripped. He tripped, but it didn't matter. The king was convinced that Haman had tried to assault his queen. The text says, Then the king said, Will he even assault the queen with me in the house? And as the word went out of the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. This mix-up sealed Haman's fate. We read then, Harbona, one of the eunuchs who were before the king, said, Behold, indeed, the gallows standing at Haman's house, fifty cubits high, which Haman made for Mordecai, who spoke good on behalf of the king. And the king said, Hang him on it. So they hanged Haman on the gallows, which he had prepared for Mordecai, and the king's anger subsided. Was Haman's falling on the couch a stroke of bad luck? If you answer yes, there's no hope for you. By a quote-unquote accidental happening, God ensured that the enemy of the Jews was put to death. We're running out of time. I won't hit on my last point. But I encourage you to consider the examples of providence relating to the Jews' domination of their enemies on your own. Uh, The Jews completely routed their enemies in the day they were to be rooted out of existence. 
It's another reversal in the book of Esther that can only be explained by divine superintendence. In closing, let me simply exhort you to take comfort in the doctrine of providence. God's hidden hand, as we've gotten a little taste of this morning, is involved in everything that happens in life, everything that happens in this world. From from the macro level to the micro level, his sovereignty is working out his eternal plan. From the decisions and actions of people, from the good looks of certain people, from people stumbling, all those things. God is working out his plan. Charles Spurgeon said, There is as much providence in the creeping of an aphid on a rose leaf as in the marching of an army to ravage a continent. Everything, the most minute as well as the most magnificent, is ordered by the Lord whose kingdom rules over all. This truth is the key to unlocking supernatural contentment and peace. Whatever may be happening in the world and whatever may be happening in your life, God's hand is in it for his glory and your good. And if you knew what he was doing, you you wouldn't change a thing. The trouble comes from us not knowing what he's doing. But that's where faith comes in. We must believe the truth scripture presents to us. And when we do so, we'll experience that soft pillow that is the providence of God. One last word this morning. Providence is only good news for the people of God. As Paul says uh, in Romans 8, 28, God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God. If you are not a believer, you need to know that providence is bad news. And why is that? Well, because providence not only ensures all the promises given to believers, but it ensures all the curses given to unbelievers. Everything God says concerning judgment and hell will come about. He will see to it that that it does. He is presently working all things out towards that judgment. The good news is that the forgiveness of sins is possible through faith in Jesus Christ. Believe Jesus, believe in him to be your savior, and scripture says you will be saved. Believe in Jesus to be your savior, and all will turn to your good, as it did to the Jews' good here in Esther. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for such a book as Esther. We thank you for the doctrine of divine providence. And Father, I ask that if uh, the precious people here remember anything from this morning, it would be that even in the darkest times, you are there and you are at work. Father, we pray for those who are going through difficult seasons, various hardships, We ask that you would strengthen their faith so that they might receive the uh, peace and comfort that this doctrine provides. Father, we look forward to the day when uh, your perfect plan will be brought to completion, when we will uh, be with Christ, reigning and ruling with him. In Christ's name I pray, amen.